From that day onwards, we were now in the camp. And the first thing we had to do is undress. I had a, I had a little ring in the watch, you know, nothing of importance. And then a young girl tattooed us. You know? The next thing they did, they took, shaved our heads. Then we went into a shower, it could have been gas, it was a shower. And from there, we went into a room to dry. And there was a woman, and she said to her, we asked what happened to the people that have gone the other way? What happened to them? What's happening? What's this? What's all about? She, she gave us to understand that we might not see them again. A survivor from the Nazi death camps tells her story to a new generation of European youth so that it may never happen again. This is the mission of Beit Shalom, England's first Holocaust memorial center. The story of Beit Shalom began 10 years ago when two brothers from Nottinghamshire went on a family holiday to Israel. It was to change their lives forever. Okay, everybody, pay attention. Follow me this way. Folks, please follow me. While visiting the city, holy to Jew, Christian and Muslim, James and Stephen Smith took the first steps on a journey that was to rock the foundations of their faith. As part of that journey, the brothers went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs Center in Jerusalem. We were overwhelmed uh, by what we saw. Um, we wanted to know why it was that we not only hadn't learned about that at school, um, but what, what does this mean to us as people? Because clearly, um, we can't blame a few Nazis for what happened. It, it, it has, it, you need to have the collusion of vast sectors of society. I had in my mind that the Holocaust was a, a Jewish problem. And then what we discovered that day was that while it was a tragedy for the Jewish community, this was clearly not a Jewish problem. But the problem is everyone's problem because whatever it was that created the conditions in which the mass murder of European Jewry took place, it was, it was there somewhere in what we call West European civilization. The family were already running a Christian retreat near Sherwood Forest. By chance, they'd called it Beit Shalom, which means house of peace in Hebrew. We felt that we wanted to build somewhere, something quite small to start with, where our contemporaries, young people, pupils from the local schools could come to at least learn a little bit about the history. We realized that there needed to be somewhere. Well, why is it that we had to go to the Middle East to learn about something that had happened in Europe? Four years later, Beit Shalom was ready to open its doors. Honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll allow me, I'll begin this day by paying honour to the memory of our six million Jewish brothers, sisters, Mothers, fathers, uncles, aunts, friends, relatives, those who so needlessly died as a consequence of the most barbaric act in the history of mankind. I think it's absolutely amazing to, that Stephen has done such tremendous work on it. I'm full of admiration for what he did, absolutely. I think that for a place like this to exist is absolutely crucial and I think that it, it sends out all the right sort of messages. This is the first Holocaust Museum and Educational Centre in England. And I, of course, especially find it remarkable that this group of non-Jews have taken the initiative. Uh, the Jewish community has been talking about a Holocaust Centre but has not yet achieved it. Young people want to know about the Holocaust. They want to know about its, its significance, why it happened, and how they can stop something like this happening again. 
and this centre will, will, will start that process in a very big way. It's a tremendous personal achievement. Uh, and whilst it's, it's in a small locality, I think its impact will be felt right across the UK. With Holocaust studies now part of the national curriculum, scholars and teachers from all over England come to Beit Shalom. Six million were murdered simply and only because they were Jewish. If you look at this book, you place six million dots in it. Six million dots. But exchange in your mind's eye these dots for people. Your mum, your dad, your sister, your brother. A typical school group will split up to visit the garden and museum, but all come back together for an educational experience that few ever forget. They can study this history in school, which they do, and that's, that's essential. As they go around the museum, this can be heightened through the visual impact, and uh, I think that has a very moving effect, and going into the gardens. But when they meet a survivor, then that brings that history into reality and I think it changes their perspective quite considerably. After three days and three nights, and on the 2nd of June, we arrived at Auschwitz. They opened these doors. There was a terrible smell. There was something falling like dust, like powder, like flakes. And we couldn't understand what was happening. And they were telling people Give the babies to older women. So my mother, who was 45, 46, took the baby from the person behind us. It was six weeks old. My father, in no time, was in another place. I saw him half, just a second. My brothers, I didn't see anymore because the women were taken to one side, the men to another side. Because of the condition that we were cramped together, my dress, the little cotton dress I was wearing, was torn. So my mother said to me, put your coat on, your dress is torn. My dress was, a, my coat was a red coat. And as we were walking along with all these people, straight, Mengele, called us back. Mengele, you know, was the one who did the selections. And he said to me, you, he said to me, you go this way. And I was holding on to my mother's arm and I wouldn't let go. He said, don't worry, your mother is going to look after the babies, the children and you are going with the young ones. And he tore me away. <laughs> and my mother only said two things. That's the end. It's not only difficult, but I think it's impossible for those of us who did not go through that experience to understand it. The role that survivors play here is an extremely important one, therefore, because they give us an insight. They can't tell us everything, but they give us an insight. And it, it takes that huge number of six million Jews or you know, millions more of other people and says, no, this is not about numbers. It's about people and their lives and how their lives are destroyed. And the fact that those survivors tell their story here day after day after day keeps it rooted in personal experience. And I think that's the only way we can really get anywhere close to this. Obviously, we can never really feel what it was like to be in the Holocaust, but this gives us kind of an indication to how it was for the people actually there and quite a, quite a challenging experience. It was very real, the, her talk, it was reliving it and um, she must have found it really difficult to actually come to terms with what's happened and it must have been very difficult for her to actually come and tell us about it. Obviously I already knew backgrounds of it, but finding out specific things like the ash raining down from people's bodies being burnt, stuff that you read and never really believe, but it is true and it's touching. I've learned um, there's quite a difference to what you read in a book and to what people actually live through, because what the woman was saying in there was completely different to what you read and the statistics and everything changes. 
where it gives a human side to things. Beit Shalom is as much a place of learning as of reflection. Thousands of roses were planted to honor the victims of the Holocaust, and the museum charts the loss not just of Jewish lives, but of their rich European heritage. We applied two criteria to everything that we did. One was that if we were putting up a picture, a garden, an exhibition of some kind, what would we feel if we were a survivor um, whose family had been murdered, um, who'd, who'd been through these, ex these experiences? Secondly, um, what, what would we, how would we respond to this if we were a 13-year-old from the mining village down the road? And so the exhibition tries to explain that the Holocaust was not just the murder of six million Jews, but the murder of one, then another, then another. We just want to try and put a face to the history of the Holocaust. Because it's quite easy to become overwhelmed, if you like, by the numbers, the figures, the history, the complexity of all of that, and, and lose track of the fact that this was about people and their lives and how those lives were affected. So the museum starts with faces. We, we're just ordinary people and ordinary lives, living in ordinary towns, going about their ordinary business. Another part of the context is that um, Judaism and the Jewish community has been in Europe for thousands of years. And with it, so has anti-Semitism. So that the Nazis didn't bring anything new, except tragically mass death. What they did was tapped in to the, the feelings and the the, the, the discrimination and the hatred and the violence that have been there for a long time. The Holocaust wasn't possible without that context. Um, then we tell a bit of the history about how the Nazis came to power and, and what they did when they came to power and again how people reacted, how the German people reacted to the Nazi presence and also how Jewish people were affected by that presence. And, and again, what happened with people. He then moves through um, the period prior to the war and eventually what happens during the war when the, the Nazis create the, the, the process of uh, the ghettos and the dehumanization and eventually the death camps and then tragically the, the whole process of, uh, of mass killing. At the end of all of that we, we focus on um, the, su the survival, not as a, we, we don't call it liberation, we call it the pain of survival because what we're saying is yes the camps were liberated but for the people, once again, that went through it, uh, this was a very painful thing because that was the point at which they realised they no longer had a mother, father, brother, sister. They had no home, no education, no country, no past, no present, no future. What kind of liberation was that? It's the survivors of the camps and those who bear witness to Nazi hatred before the war that makes this centre unique. Some came here by the strangest of ways. Out on a country walk, Lisa Vincent was literally passing by. And I happened to see the word Beth Shalom. And I thought, I knew enough Hebrew to know it's house of peace. And I rang the bell and the gates of heaven opened. And I came in and Mrs. Smith took me by the arms and said, oh, you're German and you're Jewish. And uh, you were there during the Hitler period. And I've got a little group here, will you give a little talk? And I've never stopped since. Lisa tells how she fled Germany after the terrible violence of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in 1938. She and nearly 10,000 children, most of them Jewish, found safe haven in Great Britain. From Nuremberg, she was just 16 and a half at the time. I stayed in Holland for a few months and then came during the war to England. Some of them came directly to England. But we had little ones of three and four year olds with us on the train who were just pushed on by their parents who foresaw that things wouldn't get any better, that there was the possibility of a war, a very great likelihood, and that the parents just couldn't make it because they didn't have any chance to get out. The name of Liesl from Nuremberg didn't help which I immediately reinvented myself as Betty from Dunleary. And Betty from Dunle Dunleary, I saw the name and thought it was a wonderful pronunciation, couldn't even say it properly, and uh, I thought I'd get away with Irish rather than being German because the German was 
After all, it was the enemy. And of course, we were in a predicament because uh, I was classed as an enemy alien to, to begin with, which put me behind barbed wire at Lingfield on the race course. We had labels around our necks, like cattle, really, uh, Jewish children from Germany. And uh, at the border, actually, we had to get out and some children were left behind. The German guards took them out and, uh, and the, I found their names in the memo book, memorial book of Nuremberg. So they were sent back and found their way into camps. The children's garden, I think, is quite a special garden because one and a half million children were murdered simply because they were Jewish. And uh, we have a garden with a bunker with um, stones placed in them, which we count out. And up to date, we've had 32 and a half thousand stones already laid on this memorial. This is uh, a Jewish custom anyway, because your know, flowers fade, but if you lay a stone, it's there as a memory for all time. And uh, as the students come and they lay this stone, it's permanent. And we know that when the one and a half million mark has reached, then we have remembered all those children whose lives were very valuable. Kristallnacht rang warning bells for others. In May 1939, the St. Louis sailed from Hamburg, bound for Havana in Cuba. There were nearly a thousand Jewish passengers on board, among them 15-year-old Gisela Feldman, her mother and sister. It was a luxury liner. So we kids had a great time. There was dancing in the swimming pool and the food was good. So, uh, but. On, with hindsight, I never remember my mother smiling because she obviously realized she had two kids with 10 bob in her pocket, going to a strange country, no way of working or earning a living. One just wanted to get out and that was the main objective. The St. Louis arrived but was not allowed to dock. Relatives of the passengers came out to the stranded liner. I remember one father shouting to his wife, throw my son down to me, at least I'll have him. But of course she didn't. But one man, I stood next to him when he ran out of a bathroom having cut his arteries and jumped into the water wanting to commit suicide. And then after several days we had to leave the harbour and we were cruising on the coast of Miami. But at Fort Lauderdale they sent a gunboat out in case anybody jumped overboard. So that was hopeless. Um, Canada was asked how many Jews they could take. The present, uh, the uh, immigration uh, minister at the time was a Mr. Blair. And when he asked how many Jews can you take or children, he said none is too many. And so reluctantly, the captain sailed back to Europe. And uh, just as we were nearing Europe, news came finally that um, an American Jewish representative had managed to um, four nations to agree to take us. And there was Holland, Belgium, France and England. Of course, those of us that got to e England were the lucky ones because the other three countries were overrun again very, very quickly. And I don't know, they say 75% or more of these people perished. More than any other place, Auschwitz has become synonymous with cruelty and evil. Kitty Hart Moxon was only 15 when she arrived at this living hell. For two years, she was a daily witness to the mass murder there. In 1944, when the Hungarian transport began to arrive and they cleared all the Jews out of Hungary, uh, transport began to arrive uh, in, in, in Auschwitz. Uh, they formed a special squad called the Canada Commando and I was taken to work near the gas chambers. And I worked there for eight months. It was a very small area, but it had 30 sheds. All the sheds were full of goods, stolen belongings that people brought with them. 
that were stolen and they were just jumbled up in those huts. And we, the, the girls working there, had to sort this stuff out. Um, but we were just 400, 200 on the day shift, 200 on the night shift. I worked night shift. <coughs> Consequently, I slept most of the day, but not all day. Uh, and what I happened to see was thousands and thousands of people arriving, sitting in the woods, waiting to go into the gas chambers. And so day in, day out, I saw a person uh, in green uniform, sometimes clad in white overalls, climb a ladder uh, with a tin in his hand, and he poured a substance in, through an opening. He wore a gas mask, and soon after that you could hear muffled screams and sometimes loud screams within, from the, inside the gas chamber, which lasted. It varied, sometimes a few minutes, sometimes 20 minutes. And soon after the screams, uh, smoke coming out of the very tall chimney and fire out of the chimney. And if you stood by the window long enough, at the rear of this crematorium, there was a pond. And there were a lot of bodies heaped up there because there wasn't the capacity in the ovens, obviously, to, to burn these bodies. But you saw the men who worked inside the crematorium carrying ash in hand cards and dumping it into the, um, in, in, into the pond. The garden's important because it's a counterpoint to the exhibition. One is about history and the telling of history. The other is about reflection and, and thinking and, and, and honouring in, in a dignified way those who were its victims. So out in the garden there's, there's space, there's, there's life, there's, there's, there's open air and there, is also, there are also names. Victoria Vincent was, was my friend, I guess. Um, probably the first survivor who I became very close to. I learned a lot from Victoria, not just about survival, the, the, the mechanism of surviving, but I also learned what it meant to be a survivor. The, the anguish and the nightmares and the, the, the physical discomfort. Victoria was disabled as a result of her experiences during uh, the Holocaust. I think though one of the tragic things about her story was this, I thought well we have her book, we have her video, we have all the memories and the responses and the letters of the children. When Victoria passes away it will, it will all still be there. But when Victoria passed away it wasn't the same thing. And it made me realise five years ago when she did pass away sadly and I, I lost that friend, um, that we have to think very hard about how we're going to tell this story to the future generations because it won't be the same when the eyewitnesses are no longer there. And we've got to think hard about how we're going to keep that message alive. The selections were made by Dr. Mengele and his staff and we had to stand naked, whatever the weather, and by then, well, after a few weeks, after two or three weeks, we became very thin and, and we stood out and we tried to make ourselves look strong and, and fit to work. And until this day, I cannot understand. There was no rhyme or reason why one person was deemed fit to live and the other to die. The beatings came for no reason sometimes, and well, whatever reason. Uh, not only by the SS guards, but also by the Blokovas. Who, the Blokovas are the people who kept the block of the, and they were mainly Polish or um, Germans, and uh, they, they were non-Jews, and they beat us, uh, well, they, they sort of competed with one another to who would beat us most. We were like puppets, and we did exactly what we were told, except 
there was a tiny bit of our own ego who kept saying, well, no, we, you must survive. You must survive this and tell everyone about it. How oh, nice to see you. <laughs> the work of Beit Shalom now has a worldwide reputation. It recently celebrated its sixth birthday. It has been six years, believe it or not. I find that difficult to believe because six years ago we were standing here not really knowing what we were about to do. We did know why we were doing it. That is to say, we had a vision, a sense of purpose, a sense of knowing that something had to be done in this country of ours where for two generations or so, for whatever reason, we had put the Holocaust behind us. And we felt it was time to put it before us. I don't think that we thought that in this room, in this place, 500 school children a week would come in and go out and learn here, learn about and learn from what the Holocaust was, is and should be in our, in our societies today. I don't think we thought that we'd have the journal which is on your seats, perspectives coming out two or three times a year with contributions from everyone from school children to prime ministers. We didn't expect the publishing program we have over the next three or four months. We thought we might print a book or two, but we have three or four coming out between now and January as well as a poster series and other things as well. We didn't think that we'd be establishing a film department. We didn't think that we would have a visual history archive collecting the, the voices of the victims of the Holocaust and of persecution. And so a lot's happened in six years, um, more than we could ever have guessed, I suppose. The sixth birthday celebrations continued with a ceremony to honour the righteous among the nations. Men and women who risked their lives, saving potential victims of the gas chambers. People like the diplomat Raoul Wallenberg, a fellow countryman of the day's guest of honour, who reflected on Sweden's role in the tragedy. We did too little as a nation, <clears throat> but we did a little, and the little we did we should be proud of. And the rest that we didn't do we should remember for the future. And with these words, Smith, I'm very happy to open this ribbon or cut this ribbon for opening this part of the memorial gate. Thank you. The message of Beit Shalom is clear. He who does not learn from history is doomed to repeat it. The thing I would fear most about this centre is that it becomes a tourist destination. We want people to come, we do want people to come, and we, you know, we invite people to come. But not as a kind of, let's go to the world of Robin Hood in the morning, and we'll go to the pub at lunch, and then we'll go to the Holocaust Centre uh, in the afternoon, and then go to McDonald's on the way home, having had a nice day out. Because I don't think that's what this place is about. It's about learning and reflecting and thinking and talking and sharing and struggling with the issues. So I want as many people to come as possible, but I would like to feel that people would put a day aside, because this is not just a period of history. It happened in history, but it's something that should speak to our lives too. So we've got a, we've got a, a balance to strike there that we'll, we'll try and do to give people a meaningful um, experience here that will not just last for a day or an afternoon, but last for a lifetime, I guess. Whether you are rich or poor, or whether you are a Christian or a Jew or whatever, you don't know. It may even happen to you. And therefore, you must do something about it now. Understand the whole process so that it never, never happens again. Thank you.